Good evening, and thank you for joining us for a webinar on how we experience light. This webinar is being presented by Carbon Free Fairfax, an initiative that envisions a future for Fairfax County that is healthy, sustainable, and economically prosperous without greenhouse gas emissions. My name is Monica Downs, and I am an energy analyst for Fairfax County's Office of Environmental and Energy Coordination. I will be serving as host and moderator for tonight's webinar. We are joined by two guest speakers, Annika Landrenau and Dr. Mariana Figueiro. Annika Landrenau is the Global Director of Sustainable Design at HOK. Annika manages the successful development and implementation of sustainability strategies on local and worldwide projects. Annika also serves locally on the U.S. Green Building Council's Green and Energy Codes Technical Advisory Group. She is on the Mayor's Green Building Advisory Council and co-chairs the Building Energy Performance Standard Task Force. She is on the National U.S. Green Building Council Lead Advisory Committee and is a senior fellow of the New Buildings Institute. Mariana is the director of the Light and Health Research Center at Mount Sinai and is the professor in the Department of Population Health Science and Policy at the ICANN School of Medicine. Dr. Figueiro is known for her research on the effects of light on human health, sustainability, circadian photobiology, and lighting for older adults. She is also a fellow of the Illuminating Engineering Society and the author of more than 140 scientific articles in her field of research. She discussed the significance of light and health as a topic of public interest through her TED Med talk. As a quick note, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them through the question portal on your screen. We will have time for questions and answers later in the hour. Now, I will turn it over to Annika to talk about lighting from a design perspective. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, as a de design firm, we really engage with light as an issue in a few different areas. Uh, we talk about energy and climate, we talk about human comfort and well-being, and we talk about impacts on ecology. So we've engaged with lighting as an energy and climate issue since our 2030 commitment was set in 2010. Uh, in that, we said we would reduce our lighting power density against a baseline that was set in 2010. Um, the target was 25% every year, and we've been steadily increasing that reduction. Uh, this year, we reported a 43% reduction on average across the firm, with some of our studios reporting even up to a 50% reduction. Um, and this lighting power density is measured in watts per square foot, and um, that's units of energy uh, per floor area. So um, that's something that uh, we can tangibly do just to reduce the amount of energy that goes into lighting our buildings. Uh, this goes into everything from an interior space to a whole building design. Uh, and it, what's interesting about this is we're using a lot more energy for lighting um, than uh, we're using a lot more energy for lighting than we need because a lot of people confuse watts with lumens or foot candles. Some of our projects, our uh, corporate and commercial workspaces, are able to see even a 60 to 80 percent reduction in lighting power density because we're able to light them more efficiently. Some of the opportunities to reduce lighting power density. Sorry, I. Um, I'm getting some messages that there's some challenges with the video. Uh, can everyone see the video? OK, <laughs> sorry, just want to make sure that everything is coming across clearly. OK, some of our opportunities to reduce lighting power density uh, come first from the technology. Uh, the technology uh, is, of course, LED lighting uh, has come onto the market and the, the, the price point has reduced steadily over time. Uh, so there's really cost parity. It doesn't there's not really much of a premium, if any, uh, to use LED lighting. And so incorporating that into our commercial and our residential buildings allows us to reduce the amount of energy for the same amount of lighting that we're bringing into a space. Um, in addition to that, we have controls. We have daylight harvesting controls which can steadily reduce the artificial light when there's more daylight available and then increase the artificial light when there's less daylight available. So you see the same amount of light in a space that stays steady 
um, but uh, but you can reduce the reliance on uh, energy for lighting based on available daylighting. Um, there's also dimmers and uh, occupancy and vacancy sensors that allow lights to respond to human use of the space and timers that can be set to turn lights on and off based of time of day. Um, those are particularly useful in commercial buildings. And then there's design techniques. Um, for example, we don't need to run lighting continuously um, through a space in a, in a linear fashion. Um, we can run more of a dotted line, if you will. So um, those are some of the things that we might do to reduce the number of fixtures that we use, um, which actually can save money in a project uh, and then reduce the amount of power used to light a space um, and still maintain the same amount of light that's needed. So I've been working with um, our DC codes, our local area codes, um, as well as model codes to reduce the cap that we put on lighting power density to continuously sort of lower that so that you know, we, we challenge our design community, our AEC community um, to uh, to do more with with less because the technology is available to us to save that energy and still provide high quality lighting um, and, and plentiful lighting for us um, with the technology that's out there. Um, and, and one of the things we also do is link our artificial lighting. Um, you know, those controls that we have, um, the occupancy and vacancy sensors, two things like our HVAC and our plug load controls. So when you walk into an office, for example, um, your non-essential plug loads, um, your uh, ventilation and, and cooling and everything else, can, all of those things can come on based on that sensor. Um, so many things can be used using the same sensors uh, and we can set back those things and then turn them on at full force. Uh, so a lot of energy saving things can be linked. So I'll talk about comfort for a, for a moment. When we overlight a space, because we, we think we need more watts uh, in order to have the right amount of light, we can create um, discomfort. That overlighting of a space actually is one of the common complaints that we get in workspaces. Uh, it can cause uh, eye strain and, and uh, headaches. And so um, it's really important that we do understand the difference between the necessary amount of foot candles or lumens uh, to conduct a task in a space and design for that rather than relying on the sort of old standard of, of watts. Um, again, we, we, there needs to be a, a decoupling of, of watts from, um, from lumens or foot candles. Um, this is really something that we're making people very uncomfortable by bringing too much light into a space. Um, so saving energy can also make people uh, comfortable. We find that it's better to have moderate levels of lighting, sufficient lighting for the tasks at hand, um, evenly diffused throughout a space. We don't want to have contrast between high light and low light levels because that too can strain the eye. Um, as we get older, it's harder sometimes to, um, to for the eye to go from, from high light to low light levels uh, and, and back and forth again. Um, and so just moderate, evenly distributed lighting and then task lighting uh, so that if you need um, that extra light to do some some task like fine print uh, or something else very, um, you know, um, minute that you can turn on extra light. That's why under counter lighting in a kitchen is helpful if you're chopping things or, or um, doing something else. Task lighting can be very useful, but you don't need it all the time. Um, so overlighting a space doesn't just waste energy, it can cause actual physical discomfort. Um, in the same vein, um, you know, paying attention to the light that comes into a space, daylighting is great. We want to make sure though, um, you know, we control glare. Um, we can get too much daylight on a computer screen um, that can make it difficult to see the work that you're doing. And so having ways of controlling that glare through shades or blinds uh, otherwise can save energy because with that glare can come heat gain, uh, but it also can make sure that people are comfortable. They're not getting too much light in the space. Um, and then uh, well-being. Access to natural light is very important. The way that we design a space, uh, making sure there's equitable access to that daylight, um, that we're not putting closed offices around a perimeter wall uh, and then you know opaque walls so that other people inside that, that space don't have access to that daylight, uh, but really looking at bringing down the walls and the partitions giving one, everyone access to that daylight in view um, equally is important so that and, and I, I know my uh, co-presenter Mariana is going to talk a little bit uh, as well about um, the impacts of light on, on human health, um, but, but there are impacts that keep people feeling well and productive throughout the day. 
Uh, the color temperature of light has uh, a lot of impact. Cooler light makes people more alert. Uh, warmer light can can make people a little uh, more relaxed. And so, you know, a lot of times the workplace will use a cooler light temperature, uh, particularly earlier in the day. Um, but you'll see hospitality, the food service industry will use warmer light. Um, and, and kitchens will use warmer light. Your food looks more appealing in warmer light. Residential settings tend to use warmer light. And you can tell the color temperature um, by the Kelvin. And so you, you might see 3000 K, um, 4000 K, 2700 K uh, on a light bulb if, if you're shopping around uh, at the store. And so the higher the Kelvin, the cooler the temperature, the lower the Kelvin, the warmer the temperature or the yellower the light. Um, cool light um, can disrupt if you are exposed to too much cool light and, and only cool light can disrupt your, your circadian rhythm. So having that, that change in color temperature throughout the day, um, which mimics daylight and exposure to daylight, um, can be beneficial. And so some of our clients are using circadian lighting in a space when people don't have access to natural daylight um, to help uh, sort of replicate that, that daylight exposure. Um, and even circadian task lighting, um, having a lamp at your uh, at your desk uh, that that mimics that change in color temperature throughout the day um, can do that. So um, the other thing I'll just say is for ecology, um, exterior lighting. Um, you know, just having uh, too bright of light outside. Uh, a lot of people use that for security, but um, light pollution, aside from wasting energy, can be disruptive to nocturnal species, also to your neighbors. Um, so having the types of fixtures that A, don't use too much light, but also are shielded or baffled and then um, are not too cool. Uh, I know the DC code, I worked on our green code, um, we have a maximum of 3000 Kelvin. Um, it's, it's, so it's, you know, on the warmer end of the spectrum, um, but it, it can be disruptive to the local ecology to have um, very cool or very bright uh, lights at night. And so um, that's just another area where lighting um, can be disruptive to your neighbors, both of the human and non-human variety. So, um, you know, having uh, a lower, again, more moderate level of lighting focused downward or on the home, not up into the night sky, um, makes you a friendly and much, much better neighbor. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity in lighting to save energy, uh, to make us feel better, to be healthier, uh, and to be better neighbors. It's an easy retrofit, uh, and like I said, um, getting it right uh, is, it has many benefits. Thank you. Annika, thank you. That information was great and really shows how much humans can be affected by the lighting around them. Next up, Mariana is going to talk about lighting from the health perspective. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's been a, a, a pleasure. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, OK. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, let me talk a little bit, expand a little bit on what Annika uh, talk to us about it. First of all, I mean, we tend to think about lighting as just um, an, en enabling us to see the space. And I think that um, that's where we, I always say you flip the switch on, you can see, you flip it off if you can't see. Well, light can also have other impacts on us that we don't even think about it. And one of them is it maintains us in sync with our watch or our external watch. Um, and the third way that light can help us is with um, giving us some idea of postural control and stability. So what it does, it gives you horizontal vertical lights, si similar to think about an airplane uh, landing on, on a runaway, for example, you have the lights that help guide the airplane and it would be the same thing with these horizontal vertical lights on say bathroom doors. So it helps you orient at night where to go as a night light and it also gives you horizontal vertical lights. But what I wanna talk a little bit more about today is light as the main stimulus for synchronizing your biological clock to the local time on earth. Um, so we all have a biological clock in the brain that generates and regulates circadian rhythms. Circadian rhythms are rhythms in our body that repeats set approximately every 24 hours. And light, and more specifically morning light, what it does, it resets your biological clock daily. And the reason why we need that, it's because if you are 
in a dark cave for many weeks uh, without any um, external cues. So without seeing the daylight, the sun rises and the sun sets, you're going to continue to have circadian rhythms. The difference is that these rhythms are going to run with a period slightly longer than 24 hours. So what morning light does when you get up in the morning and you get light, you actually reset your clock so that it runs exactly with 24 hours. So it is very important to get up in the morning and get that light so that you maintain that synchronization between your internal clock and your external watch. Now, uh, one of the great examples of the circadian rhythm is your sleep-wake cycle. We're diurnal species. We're supposed to be awake during the day and asleep at night, and that's supposed to happen every day. Um, now, it just so happens that if we don't get enough light during the day or if we get too much light at night, which may happen, for example, if you sit looking at your iPads or very bright screens at night, you can actually disrupt your biological clock. So what happens is by disrupting that biological clock, you are also going to affect your sleep. So you're not going to be able to maintain sleep at night. So what we have been doing is doing some research to look at how is it that daytime light can impact how you sleep at night. And we're seeing that there has been a significant impact of that daytime light on or sleep at night. We have worked with Alzheimer's patients and we're shown that if you give better lighting conditions, so bright days and dark nights, that's what you want. If you give that to Alzheimer's patients, they sleep better. They're suffering less from depression, anxiety, and agitation. We're seeing the same thing with cancer patients that are in hospitals for two to three weeks, for example, for myeloma transplant patients, and we're seeing that there is a significant improvement in their sleep. They have less inflammation. They have um, better um, or less depression, better mood because they're receiving this robust light dark pattern. Now, the biggest problem is that the light that we receive during the day, especially the light that we, we receive in the built environment and sometimes in hospital rooms or in schools or even in our homes is not bright enough to help us synchronize our biological clock. And obviously, um, I think Annika brought up very important points about you don't want to have extremely bright spaces so that you can't see and it becomes uncomfortable. You want to be able to increase the amount of light in that space so that you are delivering light that is energy efficient and yet it's still effective for your biological clock. So one of the things that how can you how can you do that? So here are some few tips that you could do that. Well, first of all, the best thing you can do and probably the most energy efficient way of doing it is going for at least one hour walk in the morning. Get up in the morning, go get your walk. You're going to get an exercise in and you're going to get your daylight in. Now, obviously, wait until daybreak. Um, it's a little bit harder in winter months. But in summer months, when we start having light earlier in the morning, it would be sort of a best idea or the best way to get that light to maintain that in synchronization. The, se the second thing is if you can't go out, sit by a window. So face the window, look at a window, and yes, make sure that there's no sun coming in. Try to find a north window so that you have daylight but you don't necessarily have sunlight hitting your face because it's going to be very uncomfortable if you have sunlight uh, hitting your face. The, the third thing that you can do if you're for example working from in a basement or in spaces where you don't have access to daylight, you can increase light but don't try to increase light coming from the ceiling. Try to get lights close to your computer screen or close to your work area and try to make sure that that light is diffuse. One of the things that we say about good lighting design is light the walls, hide the sources. Those are two very basic principles, but they're true. You don't want to be looking directly at a bulb because that can be very uncomfortable. And you want to have light color walls, and that's what Annika referred to as being a diffuse light in the environment. And one way of diffusing that light is, is painting your walls white, for example, and having the light reflect off of that walls to give you that general light. Um, the other thing that obviously just as important is to reduce evening light. Um, not only if you 
can't afford to, to buy those lights that will change the CCT, as Annika, uh, Annika mentioned. You can always have one color, but reduce the brightness. Try to minimize the amount of brightness. If you have to do computer work or screens, for example, what you want to do is you want to reverse polarity, for example. So you have black background and you have white fonts in front of your background, for example. So these are just some examples and simple things that can be done that will help you increase the amount of light during the day, reduce that light in the evening, and that will lead you to better sleep. So it is a very simple recipe. More light, preferably daylight during the day, will equal better nighttime sleep. So that's my, my tip of the day for you guys. Thank you, Mariana. As someone who sometimes struggles to fall asleep, I was taking notes during your presentation. We have some questions that we would like to ask both of you. And Mariana, I'll start with you. Many people have limited access to daylight at home or at work. Can you talk about what impact this lack of light might have on someone from a health standpoint? Well, the, the worst that can happen is you're not gonna sleep well. If you're not sleeping well chronically for many, many days, uh, there can be very negative consequences on health. Um, sleep deprivation and circadian disruption has been linked to uh, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, increased risk for health, uh, for cancer, as well as now we're learning that there is even an increased risk for Alzheimer's disease if you don't sleep well. So definitely um, daytime light is very important and good sleep is very important for health and well-being. Thank you, Mariana. Annika, is there anything you would like to add? On the impacts of light on health. I mean, we've just seen a lot of studies that show um, that, you know, there's a there's a improvement in productivity in, in school age children, improvement in test scores when we leverage things like daylighting um, appropriately and access to, to good quality light and daylighting um, and in the opposite direction when we don't do that well. Um, less productivity, um, lack of performance uh, at work and at school. So um, the impacts of, of not doing our jobs well <laughs> and designing for, for good access to light our um, diminished performance. Thank you, Annika. I have another question. How can employers do a better job of incorporating smart and healthy lighting strategies into workspaces without sacrificing aesthetics? Well, um, some of them I, I have mentioned, um, things like task lighting and even circadian task lighting are, are easy and, and really cost neutral. Um, strategies or or low cost um, strategies, um, and and things like an open office. Um, you know, we I talked a little bit about glare, and one of the ways to avoid creating a scenario where where we have to pull the shades is to pull people off the window wall. Um, you have an open office, and um, you leave a sort of perimeter zone for circulation, uh, and and then that means no one's right next to the window. Nobody has light shining directly in their eyes or on their computer screen. Everyone has equal access to that daylight, you know, lower partition heights on, on workspaces. Um, so everyone can see uh, the window and, and the daylight and the view. Um, when people get up that circulation zone, if you get up to walk around the, the workplace, um, everyone's walking around that sort of track, if you will, um, and has access to that view and daylight. And um, so uh, it just creates, and, and a lot of our clients will, will use that for um, informal collaboration space. So there'll be some chairs and tables, so if you have an informal meeting, you want to sit down and, and chat with a colleague about something, that's the zone in which you do it. And so that gives people time to spend in that zone next to the windows. Um, but uh, it's not reserved for anyone, like their desk is in the window um, space. Uh, and, it, and so it creates, you know, a really nice space. It doesn't sacrifice aesthetics. Uh, we've also um, worked with a lot of our engineers on projects where we pull the ducts and mechanical off the window wall and we're able to slope the ceiling up towards the window wall. So that allows the daylight to just come a little bit deeper into the space. And you just integrate that with the, you know, the artificial lighting. Um, and there's all kinds of ways to, you know, seamlessly integrate the, the lighting with the ceiling. Um, but that helps bring that daylighting deeper into the space as well. So 
Um, there's no reason aesthetics should be compromised. Uh, any of this can be done with, with great design partners. Thanks so much, Annika. Mariana, did you want to add your perspective to that one? No, I think that is thinking about, you know, what, what we always say is a lot of times we, we tend to think about visibility only and how you design the space just to be able to see. And one thing to pay attention for a healthy space is that um, the way you see is different than the way you respond for your biological clock. So we re and sometimes they might seem contradicting because we need more light for the biological clock and yet more light has the chance of creating more glare. So I think being able to uh, design in an, an effective and comfortable way and yet healthy way is something that people need to start implementing and that we don't see it as often, but I'm hoping that in the future, the near future, we're going to see that more. Mariana, those are some great points. Now we're wondering what's on the horizon for research around how light impacts our health. Where and how will light be used to address medical conditions in the future? Well, my hope is that um, everywhere, because I think light affects all of us in all the environments that we use. Um, I think that one that I always say it's a low hanging fruit um, is in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. These tend to be very dark spaces and very continuous light day and night, and we need robust light dark patterns. Um, so I think that in nursing homes and assisted living facilities is where I see us uh, implementing it because the research is very solid in this area. Um, I'm hoping that at home things are going to start changing because there's a lot more people working from home now. And I think that we don't have enough research showing um, that benefit of changing the lighting in the homes. And I think that's where we possibly will see the research going. And then I think we are going to start looking more at personalized light exposure. So in other words, you don't really need to, um, for, first of all, we're individuals. And as individuals, we really respond to light differently. So sometimes what's good for me might not be good for my next door neighbor or my you know, next door neighbor in a cubicle, for example, in the office. So being able to have my own personal light um, inside my house, my cubicle, wherever I work, I think that is going to be the future, more than general lighting coming everything from the ceiling. So uh, personalized lighting, um, how people accept that and how people like that, I think it's going to be the new um, frontier and more than just uh, general ceiling lights that give one type of light for everybody. Mariana, I think that information is so important for people to understand. Annika, is this concern often incorporated into lighting design? We do um, like to give people the flexibility to control lights individually. Uh, I think what Marianne, uh, Mariana said about um, uh, being able to control your own lighting and not overflowing into your, your neighbor's space is really important. Uh, and, and we have the tools to do that, uh, certainly in the workspace. Um, that's also a very energy efficient strategy, but it also allows for more personal uh, satisfaction. We find people are happier when they can control their own environment, uh, if they have control over their own lighting. Um, and we have uh, for the residential market, um, you know, people can control their lighting with their cell phones these days. So um, and, you know, they can they can dim their lights. They can control in many cases color temperature. They can connect lighting to their music. Uh, you know, I, I spoke on a panel with a woman who was um, traveling overseas for work and her daughter had an early doctor's appointment and she was worried she was going to going to miss it. So she was <laughs> overseas turning on the lights and the music to make sure her daughter was awake so she wouldn't miss her doctor's appointment. Um, <laughs> you know, there's there's ups and downs for that, but um, uh, positives and, and negatives maybe for that. But, uh, um, you know, we, we certainly, uh, I think, have the technology to be highly personal with, with our lighting uh, and, and to be able to direct it to our own personal space and, and what we're doing individually. Um, so I think there's no reason why our light should um, uh, encroach upon a neighbor's space, um, you know, I think that, that we should be able to customize our lighting for what we're doing in our own health. Thank you, Annika. I, I like the story of uh, flipping on the, the lights and the music uh, to, to wake her up. Um, 
we wanted to to touch upon the the energy savings uh, component of lighting. And in your opinion, what is the biggest consideration when leveraging light for energy savings in a residential or commercial environment? You know, I think um, certainly controllability, being able to um, dim the lights, um, maybe having uh, different zones um, can help so that you're only lighting the spaces that you need to light uh, rather than, you know, everything being on in the same way. You might want to even do that for your, your cooling system at home. Um, uh, it is not difficult to even take legacy fixtures and swap out, you know, LED bulbs uh, for them, but um, be aware that sometimes if you add LED bulbs to older fixtures um, or add LED fixtures to older controls, um, if the voltage isn't in alignment, um, you have a higher voltage control and a lower voltage light. Sometimes people hear a humming um, or have other problems. So um, if it is a retrofit project, um, you may need to bring in an electrician to help you, um, you know, redo your control system. Um, you know, unless you're very handy and you've got experience doing that yourself. Um, but, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, sort of a granularity to it um, and then even moderate light and task lighting or, um, you know, the reading lamp next to the, the chair, um, the under counter lighting in the kitchen, uh, that type of thing so that you can control for the space that you're in at any given time. Annika, thank you. Mariana, did you want to add to the energy savings piece? No, I think, um, you know, nowadays the, the technology is here and um, you know, in a way, uh, we're all going to end up uh, using LEDs, whether we want it or not. It's it's the technology out there, so may as well get get started early and start saving the energy because uh, there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of flexibility with that technology. OK, we have a couple uh, final questions here. Um, so Mariana, how can we think about light differently in our daily lives? to our benefit and the benefit of those around us? Well, very simple. Light is not just for vision. Um, I think we have to think about light as something that um, will impact our health and well-being. And we should not take light for granted. I think we, all of us take light for granted. It's just we don't even think about lighting and, you know, in a way in construction and even when we're building our homes, um, the money runs out and we end up going cheap on the lighting. Um, so don't do that because lighting can have a huge impact in how it affects your health and well-being. So I think that, and it can make your, your house or your office or anything beautiful. Uh, it can help people in nursing homes. It can help people in, in hospitals and schools. So um, think about lighting as much more than just vision. Mariana, that's great. Annika, what are your thoughts on how we should think about light differently? Well, as a, as a designer, um, certainly I would agree light has the ability to transform spaces um, and you, we don't want to sacrifice the quality of light just in an interest of saving energy. And, and um, you know, we design healthcare environments and I can think of some, we have some inpatient mental health care facilities where we, we've designed lighting um, to calm patients who otherwise could be very scared in, in, in certain environments um, or very anxious. Um, you know, we've got uh, other spaces where we have light fixtures that, that do mimic daylighting and they're deep interior spaces or they're spaces where for privacy reasons or procedure rooms, you wouldn't have a window. Um, but we've got fixtures that mimic daylighting because people are in these spaces all day long. Uh, or for many, many hours, and this gives them a sense of, of well-being. Um, it helps, you know, them feel better. Um, and light, you know, can be sculptural. It can just transform the nature of a space. Uh, it, it really, you know, can be powerful. And so we never want to sacrifice um, light just because we want to save energy. But we have the tools, we have the technology um, to be highly efficient with, with and we have free light. Um, frankly, uh, <laughs> uh, we have plenty of free light out there. So harness the free light that we have, use it wisely, um, and, and you know, uh, minimize what we need to use, we have to create energy for. Um, but don't sacrifice, uh, don't sacrifice quality of light just in the interest of energy. That's great information, Annika. Now we have one more question 
Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to remind the audience that the Q&A is open, um, so please feel free to submit any questions you have for our presenters. Um, so Annika, back to you. In your opinion, what is the most important thing the average person should know about light and how it can affect them or how they can manipulate it? Um, <laughs> Well, I think we've covered a lot of a lot of that ground, um, but uh, you know, you certainly um, you know dimmable light. If you if you don't have dimmers at home or at work, um, you know, don't be afraid to use them. Uh, I have them, you know, in in my home uh, and use them regularly. You don't need to use your your light at full wattage all the time. Um, you know, photo sensors um, are great. Um, you know, you you can control light a lot more um granularly than than just on off uh and so um you know that and that uh, you know leds really are pretty much cost neutral now so hopefully everyone can go out and um and get them but uh you know there's just a lot out there and i hope people go out and explore and don't just you know replace the bulb you have but go look at what's available to you and and play with it and there's so much out there with color temperature like you can get color temperature tunable lights um, you know, for your home uh, and decide what works for you, um, you know, what you're comfortable with in your home and some you can actually tune from day to night and some that you, you decide what's the right temperature for your space um, before you install them. But um, really, you know, find find what works for you and what makes you feel good in your home or in your workplace. Um, there's just so much out there. Annika, that's great. Mariana, what do you think is the most important thing the average person should know about light and how it can affect them? Um, that light can help you sleep better. Um, well, light during the day can help you sleep better at night. So uh, make sure you have this robust light and dark in your life. I think this is really the most important thing that you can remember. And once you do that and you start sleeping better, it seems like everything else will fall into place. Um, so that would be my simplest recommendation. Make sure you get your dose of bright light during the day, however you can do that. Okay, it looks like we have an audience question. Um, they were looking for the easiest suggestions for SAD, which I'm assuming is um, the Seasonal, seasonal, seasonal affective depression. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, the easiest one is obviously um, go outside, go for a half an hour walk, an hour walk um, in the morning. Um, obviously, this doesn't always happen in the winter, or it's not always possible in the winter because um, some places we have very bad winter, so we don't want to be out. Um, some people do use light boxes. Personally, I think the light boxes are extremely bright and sometimes very uncomfortable. So there are solutions that you can do. Everything that we talked about or all the tips that I gave, sit by a window, open up your shades, let the daylight in your space. If you need to add some lights around your computer screen, remember you don't want to look directly at the bulb, but diffuse light. Keep that those lights uh, while you work, while you do email, while you read. Just increase the general diffuse light um, around you for at least a couple of hours in the morning. Do it when you get up. That's the best time, even though there has been some successful results in the evening. But the best would be the morning. The most of the studies have done have seen uh, seasonal depression um, improving in the morning. And obviously, I think you should talk to your physician. That's obviously something important. Sometimes it's a combination of light and antidepressants. So, you know, definitely talk to your physician. But um, going outside when it's daybreak, it's probably your best bet. Thank you so much for that, Mariana. And it seems we have another question that is more um, in the health realm. So I'll uh, shoot that over to you as well. Um, what type of light is helpful or harmful to those suffering with migraines? You know, this is a really good question. We're actually, um, I, as we speak, am writing a proposal on that. Um, there has been some work. Well, first of all, in general, people that suffer from migraine can be what they call photophobic, which means they can be very sensitive to light. And 
when people are having the migraine in general, they go to a dark room because the light actually exacerbates the migraine. Now, there also has been some work looking at the impact of green light on reducing incidences of migraines. So the exposure to that light happens when, not when the person is having migraines, but it just happens daily. They have a daily exposure to that green light. And one of the hypotheses is that this morning green light actually helps entrain the biological clock, then people sleep better and that minimizes the incidences of, of migraine. Now, these are all very, very uh, new studies and studies that need to be replicated and need to be done in larger populations. Um, and that's why we're writing a proposal to be able to start investigating this area. So when a person is having a migraine attack, the best would be to avoid light and have a dark room. Um, otherwise, there is this hypothesis about the green light daily in the morning improving uh, migraine incidences. But again, this is still very, very new research, so I'm not sure it's it's ready for for practice and, and daily lives yet. That's great. I'm excited to hear about the research being done there. And it looks like we have um, one last audience question um, that I'll, I'll um, post to you first, Mariana, and then I'll, I'll come over to you, Annika. Um, so our audience member says that they are very sensitive to natural light and has noticed that the light they experience on the West Coast hits them differently than the light on the East Coast, even at approximately the same latitude. And they were wondering if there is a, a difference in the nature of light um, based on that, or if perhaps um, it was just in their imagination. Well, I mean, you know, a lot of what you get in terms of daylight also has to do with how it comes through the atmosphere. So for example, if you go to China, you have a lot of air pollution. So, you know, it, it, daylight is daylight, but it has to still filter through the atmosphere. So it may very well be that there is some changes in the atmosphere between East and West. Um, but other than that, I, I mean, I wouldn't know why it would be uh, different. Obviously, you know, higher latitudes and you, you clearly have cloudier skies. I mean, it's very well known about Seattle that it's, you know, very cloudy and you don't get as much daylight. Um, you have probably more bright days in Boston than you have in Seattle, for example. So I think that there's, there could be a variety of reasons, um, you know, associated with weather and with uh, air pollution and atmosphere. Thanks so much for that, Mariana. Monica, did you want to add on? No, I think those are those are great factors that could potentially um, impact the way you experience light, the altitude that you're at, you know, on at the, that latitude on either coast, um, you know, uh, time of year, uh, any of those things um, and time of day that you're experiencing the light. Um, it, it's hard to say, um, but I don't know of any um, any research into whether or not there's there's a anything you know known to impact the quality of light um, at the same latitude on different coasts. Great, thank you so much, Annika. I was wondering if you could give an example of an innovative or particularly interesting project or use case in your sphere where light was used to influence the human experience in a positive manner. Sure. Well, I mentioned a couple of healthcare applications where, you know, we've used warmer light um, in inpatient mental health care facilities uh, in, for example, um, bathing rooms to help calm patients. We also coupled that with so heated floors and, and other things so that um, just to make the environment feel a little bit less harsh, um, we have and the, the sky boxes, which are um, for rooms that don't have access to uh, windows or natural light, um, it's it's like a window. It's framed out like a window. Um, the space behind this window um, is is wider than the the framing, and then it goes through sort of um, the natural you know patterns of light uh, that you might see over the course of the day, um, and and variations and color temperature and and looking like clouds passing, other things. 
So it just gives what if you're in the space for for long periods of time, you know, it mimics how light might come through the window. Um, but one of the projects that's really interesting um, we worked on was uh, the Inouye Regional Center in NOAA, uh, for NOAA in um, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. Uh, and in this one, um, it's two World War II air, era uh, aircraft hangars and uh, NOAA was converting them for their use. Um, and so uh, we had some clear stories and skylights, but there was too much, you know, contrast essentially the lights coming in in these spots, but elsewhere you're not getting much daylight. So you've got bright spots of daylight and then and then no daylight. And we wanted even diffuse light for everyone. And so um, we created these custom lanterns that would diffuse the, the light. Uh, and we did some half scale mock ups and we tested them on the roof of these buildings, you know, um, and, and we got to where we could evenly distribute the light throughout the space. And it's just, you know, it created a really nice environment. These, these, when you're in these spaces, the daylight is really evenly distributed. Um, so everyone has this great even light level uh, and it's daylight. And there, so we're using the, the light and the daylight in these lanterns. So um, it was just something that completely changes the character of the space. Um, and it, it, it is green, it, it uses less, uh, energy, but also makes that space just feel a lot better to be in. Thanks, Annika. That's a that's a great story. Uh, Mariana, did you have um, an example? Yeah, we have a couple of examples. We just finished up uh, a school for uh, special needs um, uh, students, and we were asked. I mean, we don't do design um, in general. What we do is sometimes. Um, demonstration of some of the research principles to try to bring that into real life and collect some data uh, on the reaction. And, and we had a, a room that was really all, almost like a sensory room that was all done with lighting. So changing, using a lot of saturated colors of light, um, you know, a blue or playing with colors and um, the, the, the students absolutely loved uh, the, the, the whole idea of being able to play with the lights to change their mood and to be able to understand the environment. So that was very nice to see um, how we could distract them with the light and then calm them down because they were entertained with, with working with the lights. So that was one of them. And then obviously the one that I'm always fascinated with is um, Alzheimer's disease patients. I mean, we put the lights and we had a very interesting application where we developed a light table. So what that is, a lot of the Alzheimer's patients, they sit around tables in common areas and they spend most of the day there, either eating or doing any activities. So we created a table that actually the light came from, from the table because they're always looking down. So it was a great way to deliver that light at the eye for the circadian. Well, it was very interesting. Two things were very interesting. First of all, the light table normally sat four people and the people were flocking to the light table because it was just attractive to go. Now, one day we had to develop a smaller table because we didn't have all the, because the, we actually made these light tables out of TVs. So we got 70 inch TVs and we made them tables. So we got a smaller TV, a 40 inch, and there were only one or two people in the table. So we sat one of the subjects in the table and she didn't like it. And the reason why she didn't like it was because she was by herself on the table. So she looked like she was singled out. So it is interesting how the light, first of all, attracted people, but it was all about the social interact interaction. So what the light did, it really allowed people to interact with themselves. So I thought those were two things that you don't even think about lighting, um, you know, changing social interactions. And that's really what we were doing in addition to giving them healthy lighting. So that was, th those are two very, I think, interesting things that we observed in our studies. That's great. Yeah, I had never thought about the, you know, the impact of light on the, on the social aspect of things. So it looks like we've covered all of our questions and all of our audience questions. So we can wrap up. I wanted to thank everyone for joining this carbon free Fairfax webinar on how we experience light. Annika and Mariana, we appreciate you providing your unique perspectives. If you enjoyed this webinar and want to know more about upcoming offerings from carbon free Fairfax 
or the rest of the Office of Environmental and Energy Coordination, please visit www.fairfaxcounty.gov slash environment energy coordination slash events, and that's on the slide. If you have any questions, please email carbonfreefairfax at fairfaxcounty.gov. Thank you and have a great night.